Hello everyone and welcome to Dakota Bowl week as we prepare for what should be a thrilling final day of the North Dakota high school football season alongside Brad Anderson 1039 the truck and Chase Miller from your live event. My name is Jody Norsted from Midco Sports. We're here to try our best to make sure you know what to look for in each matchup from the big schools to the nine man division. And before we look forward, we must reflect back to the semifinal round. I'll give you both a chance to tell me what grabbed your attention the most amongst the outcomes of the eight semifinal games. Brad? Well, Dickinson Trinity uh, just kind of jumping on Velva. You know, they, they gave up the first score and then ran, got what, uh, got a field goal and three touchdowns, and they pretty much had Velva chasing points. I think that was a little bit surprising. Um, and then obviously what uh, what you know Grand Fork Central did as well that run just to see that was a team we thought would would kind of be in the mix to start the year and then they they struggled and then here they are they've uh, kind of slid through the back door a little bit and then just that big play at the end they lost the receiver there at the end to win so you know it's great to see that two way class has always been the class it's always kind of been the that class has never been what we thought would, it could be because mm -hmm. Shanley and St Mary's dominated for a long time just to see the parity in that class has been kind of fun. Yeah, and to Brad's point, I would have gone with Central, but I'll also say uh, the other one that kind of not so much surprised me, just the outcome of what they were able to do, Minot coming back in comeback fashion against West Fargo Cheyenne after losing at Cheyenne earlier in the season for that Magi to get over the hurdle, to get to the Dakota Bowl. Uh, it's going to be fun because those two teams haven't played this season with the Magi and Shanley. Sometimes you get to the Dakota Bowl in 2A and 3A, you've said, mm -hmm. okay, these teams have already played, so we know what's going to happen. Uh, I know we're going to get into it, but Magi, the Deacons, that could be a lot of fun in the nightcap. Yeah, we'll preview that uh, coming up in a little bit. But yeah, like you mentioned, to rally from 17 down in the third quarter, that took a lot of grit. They convert a lot of third and fourth downs, mm -hmm. got some interceptions, a pick six. Chauncey Hendershot, I mean, he took over back in 2020. Uh, two wins his first year, two wins his second year, six wins last year. They lost to Shanley, I believe, in the quarterfinals yep. last year. Uh, but back and have a shot to win their first state title since 1980. Chase and I were both <laughs> not born. No. Brad, I believe you were a toddler at that point. I was about four. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, there was no Instagram either, by the way. <laughs> it, there were pen pals, yes. if anyone knows about that. Well, let's move ahead and talk about these matchups going in the order that they'll take place. At 9-10, we get the nine-man championship pitting North Prairie against the three-seed South Border. Both went through some battles to get here. West Hope, Newburgh, Glenburn had no answer for Blake Matson in that rushing attack. Matson rushed for over 400 yards in the 54-36 win. Meanwhile, South Border simply capitalized on more two-point conversion opportunities than New Rockford, Cheyenne, Maddock to reach the title game. Other than that, two pretty evenly matched teams in this one. So we have North Prairie and South Border. Chase, what do you feel can be a difference maker in this one? Yeah, getting off the field on three and out early in a possession. And also you kind of, it's the old coach's cliche, but so true. Turnovers and where's your breakfast at? Because it's going to have to be like at 6.30 in the morning to get ready for 9-10 kickoff. We always hear coaches kind of say, you get to this time, do you practice indoors instead of outdoors to kind of get used to that 70 degree temperature? Uh, what's the turf going to feel like? Well, I think both teams teams as we kind of alluded to here earlier before we got on like to run the ball a lot and the biggest thing that I take away is New Rockford Cheyenne uh, in overtime gave North Prairie their only loss of the season they've won by 14 points with everybody else since the second time around to Nelson County well for South Border uh, kudos to them the first time they ever won a region championship and first time they ever make the Dakota Bowl and they've had to do so gutting out a couple of wins by four points in the quarters and the semis to do so Berkeley France Colstock obviously they're dudes for the Rock and then on the opposite side, as you mentioned, Madsen, I mean, when you get five rushing touchdowns in a semifinal, you know you're doing something pretty well here. So there's highlights. This could easily be the best game of the day. But anytime you get to that 9, 10 in the morning game, a fast start, minimize turnovers, and which defense can get off the field early, I think, are going to be keys in this one. Brad, anything to add? I think the piggyback on that, yeah, if you can get North Prairie, uh, if they get downhill right away early, especially with Madsen, if South Border can at least slow them down, force them into third down, and you know, we were talking about what's the over-under on throwing the football going to be in this game that North Prairie doesn't want to throw it at all. So if you get them into third and eight, third and nine, does that change their game plan any? And to, to piggyback what Chase said, to basically try and get them off the field at least a couple of times. I don't know if you want to get into, you know, just swapping touchdowns here and there with this, with, uh, this North Prairie team because they can, they can score, and score in a hurry. Yeah, and I think... To your guys' point as well, explosive plays are key. South Border has had a knack for Berkeley France breaking off big runs. South Border needs to hit on at least probably four explosive 40, 50-plus yard touchdowns to win this game. And the reason being that 
I just don't know how many times they're going to be able to slow down North yep. Prairie. They're going to need to score um, because that ground game is so good. Uh, North Prairie back in the Dakota Bowl, of course, for the first time since finishing runner-up to Richland in 2015. That epic finish with the Colts winning on the uh, hook and ladder play. South Border appearing in its first Dakota Bowl. Mustangs head coach Evan Melmer tells me there's been quite the buzz around Ashley and Wishick this fall, and for good reason. And they might look a little familiar because Melmer coming from that Jim Dooley, Beulah look. <laughs> uh, it, it'll be interesting. I think South Border fans or casual football fans will see a little bit of Beulah in this South Border team. Well, the Class A championship is a battle of unbeatens. Kindred held off Langdon in the semifinal round thanks to a two-point conversion stop late. Meanwhile, Trinity rumbled to a win over defending champ Velva behind Ty Dossinger's four-touchdown game. Brad, what does Kindred have to do to win their second title in three years? Well, talking with the Kindred coaches after the game Saturday, and we are talking about Trinity, and they just, a couple of them said, boy, they're fast, they're speed. Um, but I think Kindred's got the edge up front. I think Sunram and uh, Filler and Fornshell and those guys, I think they've got to... They've got to set the tone of the offensive line early. I mean, Kindred's game plan, Eric Burgad, I had a great quote and I was talking to him last week. He says, he says, we don't, we don't, over, we don't overcomplicate football. It's pretty simple in what we do. And um, they establish things. Starsevic obviously does a great job, but uh, between Hoime and Tyson Johnson, I think they've just, in that offensive line, they're, they're steady. And I think, you know, sometimes your best defense is taking five, six minutes off the mm -hmm. clock and playing keep away. And, you know, if they can turn it into a possession game, and, you know, after that first half was wild with three touchdowns in 33 seconds, then it became a possession game in the second half. But, and the other thing, too, I think is maybe a little bit concerning for Kindred is they really got shut down offensively, shut out in the second half, and they had about 50, 60 yards of total mm -hmm. offense. So you got to be able to keep the foot on the pedal here for four yeah. quarters. And, Chase, people that follow these teams probably know about Jake Starcevic, the All-State QB, linebacker for Kindred, and Ty Dossinger, Trinity's stud running back and linebacker. Give us an X-factor player for both teams for Friday. Yeah, the first thing is going to be the line, and there's too many guys to name them yeah. all here, Jody. So I think the, the physicality of Kindred, is this going to be the best line that maybe Trinity has seen all season? If that's the case, can they stop those uh, sweeps? Can they stop those uh, quick quickness that uh, Brad was talking about. Also, for me, it's uh, uh, Owen Hoime. If he can get the ground going to to Brad's point, that's going to be large. And for Dickinson, Trendy, how about Nicholas Sobolik? I mean, you talk about two-point conversions in nine-man football. If you can make a field goal late and a half, mm -hmm. if you can convert your PATs, those are the hidden points sometimes in a three, four-point win or a loss that you go, shoot, we missed a 30-yard field goal or ah, we had a block point after attempt. So I think Nicholas Sobolik is going to be someone there. Trinity just has, like Brad mentioned, they have speed, whether it's Dossinger, Luke and Jake Schaub, the receivers, Gage Glasser, Jeremiah Jillick, all these guys, I've routinely said on Varsity Sports Live their names because they're all getting highlights from the quarterback, Jace Kovash, and I brought it up last week and bring it up again. The Titans' defense has made some massive strides from last year to this year. I think it was around 24 points per game they were allowing last year, under nine this year, and that's why they're playing in this final game uh, of the season. Let's go to the Class AA Championship, which will kick off around 3 o'clock on Friday. North is in the Dakota Bowl for the second straight season after ending Horace's impressive run to the Final Four in just their second year as a program. Shout out to those Hawks. Central playing the role of Cinderella in this movie is into the championship as the seventh seed. Heck, their coach just had a baby on Monday <laughs> night. How busy is that for Jake Shower and his family? So congrats to them. But we had an eight seed make it in 3A last year with Century, and now the seven seeded Knights are in and playing in their first state championship since they won the title in 2005, back in the days of Jake Landry and Ryan Kosowski uh, with the legendary coach Mike Berg at the helm. Let's start with the obvious key for both teams. For North, feed the soon-to-be state senior athlete of the year, Peter Haugo. The football for Central, trying to stop it. Is it that simple, Brad? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Basically it is, yes. I think it's it's... Not that the whole offense is predicated around him, but obviously he's going to be priority number one. And can you, not that Ethan Well can't make plays, but I think if you're central, you got to make him, he's got to make a play. Uh, he's got to be able to find his receivers. Um, you know, I know they've dealt with some injuries and a few things North has, so it hasn't been, I mean, it's been an unbeaten season, but it certainly hasn't been perfect at times. But um, yeah, I think if, if you can get him in a second and third down, and I think if Well can just, you know, if he, if he has to make a play or two during that game, I think it's going to be really key. Yeah, and he's done that at times. He's got some good tight ends. Joe Rose, Carter Zeller, he's made some plays too. Chase, for people that haven't followed the Central Knights football program all season, how different is this team compared to the one that North hammered back in August, 48-7? to Oh, well, this is a revenge tour for Central because at one point they were 1-3 and three on the year. They lost to South, check. They lost to Jamestown, check. 
Now they lost to North. We will see. So they won in three. They've won five straight, six out of seven. Um, the one biggest thing for me is they've only given up 23 points in two playoff games. Mm -hmm. So that defense has been going after it after they lost to Jamestown, South, and North by a combined 117 to 28 in the regular season so again give a lot of credit to jack simmers he's a one-person wrecking crew give a lot of credit to their head coach and tyler uh, whaling as well he's been all over the field making tackles this central team jody it kind of feels like it flipped when they won the cushman classic they lost to horace but since then they maybe got a little right with devil's lake with wapitons they picked up wins but when they found ways to win on the road in convincing fashion against south they went out to Jamestown, and the Blue Jays have had the tradition on their side. You beat mm -hmm. them. I mean, realistically, North has everything to gain. Uh, North has everything to lose, if you will, and Centr Central might have everything to gain in this one, as you mentioned with Cinderella, because everyone expected the Spartans to be here. I think people thought Central could be here, but to Brad's point earlier, when you started 1-3, and three, you played from behind the eight ball, and they've been playing awfully well. Change at quarterback, and it certainly helps Central. Yeah. Too, so. yeah, Jack Simmers coming in, taking over, I think it was maybe week four or week five that they turned to him and just said, we're going to ride and die with you, young man, and he's got some good receivers. Leo Strandell has made some plays. Yeah. Trey Koontz had the big touchdown. Uh, as well, and uh, yeah, Simmers, 11 passing touchdowns, 11 rushing touchdowns, also a force on defense, four picks and three fumble recoveries. But speaking of numbers, Peter Haugo, 1,300 rushing yards and 23 touchdowns, I believe, going into the Dakota Bowl. He has been a star, and he'll look good in the Fargo Dome probably in years to come as well as a future Bison. Well, the night closes with the AAA state championship where Shanley is hoping to repeat as state champs and extend their winning streak to 16 games, which is the new longest active streak after Velva lost last Saturday. The Deacons reached the Dakota Bowl thanks to a 31-8 victory over Davies behind a four-touchdown game from Landon Meyer and two touchdowns and a pick from Sam Oshek. The Deacons will play Minot, who trailed on the road to Cheyenne last week 30-20 at the half before scoring 27 unanswered in the fourth quarter to win big 47-30. Chase, in retrospect, that might have been the best thing to happen for Minot because it prepares them for what they'll likely have to do Friday against Shanley, and that's score a ton of points to keep up with the Deacons. Yeah, the question is, can you hold Shanley to under 30? You know, and if you can hold Shanley to under 30 and maybe play at Snail's Place kind of a game a little bit with Ruziska at, at a tailback, can you feed him the ball? Can you get four or five yards? Can you stay ahead of the chains? I think uh, to Brad's point earlier, you're saying about Trinity and, and Kindred, that might be Minot's best defense is keeping that offense for Shanley off the field. And the biggest thing here for when I look at Shanley, um, you know, they don't run the ball a ton. Landon Meyer gets the ball out quickly, but he's their leading rusher by about 500 yards. Mm -hmm. So can you key on Meyer and do you, do you put a spy out there? Do you say, we're only going to put five guys at the line. It's going to come down to our middle linebacker making plays in space. Um, it's going to be curious to see the cat and mouse game a little bit here. But yeah, for, for Minot to come back and come back fashion, score 40 plus points, as you mentioned, Jody, on the road, and they might need to do it again here to beat the Deacons. Brad? Yeah, I think, think a couple things that different with Shanley even compared to last year is the fact that Meyer, they can, he's more of a running option than Rosberg was. Mm -hmm. And I remember Troy Matter telling me when the season started, he says, our deepest, our deepest basically spot on the football field is our offensive line, which is hard to believe considering all the playmakers they have. So up front, I mean, they can win the battle up front too, which seems kind of hard to believe considering, you know, what a, what a scoring circus it can be for them. But um, but, you know, I think up front, and I think Chase is right, I think you see, you've got to play keep away a little bit and just limit possessions if you possibly can. And, you know, they were able to get some defensive points last week, might not was. That might, uh, they might have to somehow force a turnover to. Shanley doesn't turn it over often, and when they've had this year, it seemed like it hasn't hurt them much. Yeah, it's just so quick, and right. it's, it's tough to, to throw that offense off. This is an interesting nugget, by the way. Shanley needs to score 11 points to become the highest scoring Class A football team in state history. That's 3A or 2A. They're currently second all time behind the 2009 Bismarck High team, which scored 543. The Deacons are at 533 points, which is absolutely insane. And for, much as, uh, for as much love as that Shanley offense gets, which is deserving, uh, the defense has been really good over the last month. They've given up 22 points total in the playoffs so far. They turn you over. They force seven turnovers in two postseason games. They got their All-State linebacker back just in time for the end of the regular season. And now in the playoffs, Adam Leininger's playing at a high level. He was in on 13 tackles last week, had two picks. They'll need to be ready to tackle because Minot has that one-two punch of Tyson Ruziska and uh, Griffin Broderick, both average over seven yards per carry. Again, if Minot can do that in the Dakota Bowl, that'd be a good 
means to success as well. I'll be curious to see, Jody, what that is going to allow if that does happen mm -hmm. and how much can they play keep away. Can you give Shanley 25, 28 points? If you can hold the Deacons to under 30, I think you really have a really good shot. And on the flip side, if Shanley does win this with all their really good playmakers and state champions, is this the best team ever, to your point, scoring yeah. the most points in Fargo, Shanley, or North Dakota football because they have been as advertised from the start of the season back in August. It's a good point as well. It should be a fun day at the Fargo Dome. Four champions will be crowned at Dakota Bowl 31. And yes, we have a central helmet coming on the way. <laughs> It'll be on the set on Friday for Varsity Sports Live. Shout out to Tony Bina for helping us out with that. Brad and Chase, thank you guys uh, so much. It's fun to do this every year. Uh, they help us out through the playoff run. For everyone watching, make sure you tune in. Varsity Sports Live on Midco Sports that night at 1030 on Friday night for extended highlights and reaction from those four games and several South Dakota state championships. We'll see you then.